uh, assignment solutions. Uh, okay. So you have the extra challenge that you have to write it in a way that it is easy to understand. Why is this so? Well, there are 720 enrolled students, and I have about uh, uh, eight or 10 markers. And if you count the number of hours they are paid, it comes about two minutes per problem. So you have to write your solution in such a clear way that the tutor can figure out within two minutes whether you are right or wrong. So this means uh, do not write a verbose solution uh, excessively pedantic. Write just the main, uh, write it in a concise way but reasonably complete so that someone can code your solution. Yes? Do we need to write a proof? Do you need to write a proof? You need to write just a short justification why this is why your argument works. Sim this can be just counting, say, in this problem, how many questions you ask, but nothing uh, more than that, uh, right? So that if I read your solution, I'm convinced that uh, it meets the criteria of the problem, okay? So that's important. Uh, you will learn another skill, how to be concise. You know, in ancient Greece, uh, they introduced a law that if you speak uh, on, a, you know, Greeks had direct democracy, so they would all, from a single city, right, gather on the main uh, square, and then whoever talks, can talk only while standing on one leg to limit so that no one gives them blah, 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 right? So please write your solutions to be concise. Also, uh, even though they do their best, the tutors make mistakes. So if you think your solution is correct, but... Um, uh, don't, uh, and, but the tutor didn't give you an appropriate mark. Don't panic. S uh, come to my office hours and I will gladly uh, remark your assignment. Uh, but you have to print it out and bring it to me because I don't have direct access. Only my admin has access. Okay, so this much about the, as I say, the main purpose of the assignment is that you get feedback whether you are on the right track or not. Okay, so use it for that purpose. Okay, so now let's proceed with the fast Fourier transform. So recall that we had a matrix representation of polynomial evaluation, right? Here, you have all the powers up to n minus 1 of the kth root of unity, namely omega n to the power k, right? And notice that the of course, in this matrix, there will be lots of wrapping around because this product, n minus 1 squared, of course, greatly exceeds uh, n. So uh, there are lots of repetitions in this matrix, which is what uh, allows, in fact, fast Fourier transform to be fast. And, uh, of course, to get the values, you simply multiply each row of this matrix with uh, the corresponding... Uh, column of coefficients, right? Now, um, so FFT is nothing but replacing n squared many multiplications present here with uh, an n log n uh, procedure, right? And we know that uh, if you have the values, right, and you want to get the coefficients, you have to multiply these values by the inverse of this matrix. But guess now, 
something kind of miraculous happens because the inverse of this matrix it's essentially just its complex conjugate. Namely, we will show that the inverse of this matrix is obtained simply by complex conjugating all the entries. What does it mean? Because omega n to the minus something, uh, minus is uh, right, just the complex conjugate because um, just because instead of cosine uh, uh, k times 2 pi over n plus i times sine, you will have minus i times sine, and that corresponds precisely to the negative exponent. So we want to see, and the only extra thing is that you have to divide by 1 over n. Okay, so notice this is finding inverse matrix, which is usually a difficult job. Roots of unity have this extra feature that finding inverse matrix uh, can be done in a simple way by taking complex conjugates and dividing by n. So let's see that this is the case. What we have to verify is that if I, you see, what does this say? Uh, this, uh, what does this say? Uh, this says that if I multiply this matrix with uh, that matrix, I have to get n times um, the, uh, the unit matrix, right? One with the ones on the diagonal. So let's verify that this is the case. So what is... Uh, the entry on the, uh, that corresponds to the product of i tro with j column, right? So the entry i j in the product matrix. Well, here is the i tro, here is the j column. If I multiply, notice what we get. We get the sum of omega n to the power i times k times omega n to the power minus j times k, right? That's when you multiply term by term. You can, of course, put now this uh, product uh, as a single exponent, omega n to i minus j times k. Now we consider two uh, cases. If i is equal to j, right, if you are multiplying the i row with i column to get the diagonal entry of the matrix. If i is equal to j, this will be 0. What is omega n to power 0? Just 1. What is sum k equals 0 to n minus 1 of 1s? It is exactly n because there are n 1s to sum. So voila, on the diagonal, you will get n. If, uh, um, if i is not equal to j, then this is a uh, geometric progression, right? There are powers, uh, so you just fix i minus j, uh, and you take its powers. So this is the formula, right, for sum of a geometric progression. You have to... Uh, take omega n to power 1 plus n minus 1, which is just n, right? And divide by 1 minus whatever the basis is, which is omega n to i minus j. Now, notice we need i not equal to j so that this is not 0. But what is omega n to the power i minus j times n? Well, this is omega n to the power n to the power i minus j. Omega n to the n is 1. 1 to i minus j is 1. And so this 1 and this minus 1 cancel out, and you get 0. So what do we get? We get this, that the product of these two matrices is diagonal matrix with all entries on the diagonal equals to n. And, of course, this means if you divide both sides by 
1 over n, you get this formula for inverse matrix of this matrix. Okay? Now, but what does this say? This says something uh, extremely important. Um, because, so remember, this is to go back from the values to the coefficient form. But notice, this is exactly the same matrix except that all the numbers have been complex conjugated, right? So, um, what does this mean? It means that the very same algorithm that we applied to go forward, right, uh, can be applied to go backwards, right, except that the role of omega is replaced, will be played by uh, omega n to the minus one, and only at the very end you have to divide everything by n. Right, so um, here is what you get. This is the inverse fast Fourier transform. What you do is you do exactly the same what you did for the forward Fourier transform, except instead of omega n, uh, yeah, this is kind of misnomer now, this omega n uh, is not really the root of unity, it's just the variable uh, used here. I should have put omega n to the minus one. Okay, so the only difference is that you replace um, primitive root of unity with its complex conjugate, and only at the very end you divide by the length of the sequence, which is n. So the very same algorithm takes you from the coefficients into values and from the values back to the coefficients with only difference that omega n is replaced by omega n to the minus one, right? And uh, also um, you divide at the very end by uh, uh, n. So, uh, and in fact, even the same hardware is being used uh, for, in your processor. It has, lots of processors have specific circuits uh, for fast computation of uh, uh, for the fast Fourier transform, something called butterfly uh, circuits. So actually the very same circuits can be used for both uh, uh, operations. Okay, now to make things a little bit more confusing, we have followed the textbook, uh, Corman, Lasersson, Rivers, Stein, and I believe the same is true of, uh, I should check, but I think also the um, Kleinberg and, uh, uh, what is her name, uh, Eva Kleinberg and, uh, Oh, gosh, I'm getting uh, senile. Um, so in the t other textbook, you also... Tardos, Eva Tardos. So um, forward operation is defined as evaluating polynomial at the roots of unity. However, electrical engineers swap the two and take the forward operation to be one that, uh, eva that uh, evaluates the polynomial at uh, roots of unity to the negative powers, right? Um, so, in fact, this is a better option because uh, if you do it this way, uh, your, this operation of taking a discrete Fourier transform has a nice geometric meaning, which is what we want to do uh, next. Before we do that, let's do just a quick uh, tweak of the DFT. You see, this is pretty annoying that uh, 
This doesn't say that this matrix is inverse matrix of that one because in the product you get this annoying factor n. So we tweak this by distributing this n between the two matrices. And then, so now we get, so these are the two original matrices, but each is divided by a square root of n. Why do we do that? Because the product of these two matrices now is indeed the unit matrix, right? It's the unit matrix, which means that these two matrices are really inverse to each other without anything at all, right? So in order to have this nice feature, we tweak the definition of the discrete Fourier transform. Electrical engineers usually don't uh, do it, but keep dividing by n when they get the uh, direct Fourier trans the inverse Fourier transform. But a very nice, as you will see, in order to achieve this geometric interpretation, instead of defining discrete Fourier transform as the values of this polynomial, we define it as values of this polynomial multiplied by one over square root n. So in effect, this polynomial on the right. Okay, and as I mentioned, instead of roots of unity, we take roots of unity to the negative powers. So, um, the, the, on the other hand, the inverse uh, discrete Fourier transform will be defined by evaluating the same polynomial, but this time at the roots of uh, uh, unity. So we swapped uh, uh, the, the definition of direct and inverse Fourier transform. So when you read a paper or a textbook, that is about the discrete Fourier transform, make sure you understand which definition is used because you have in the literature um, uh, both definitions uh, uh, used very frequently. Okay, so what is our now, um, what have we accomplished? We still have this difference that the direct Fourier transform now will have e to the minus i 2 pi n, right? Um, while the inverse Fourier transform here, right, will have positive um, root of, just root of unity on the positive exponent. And both of the results will be divided by the square root of the um, length of the sequence. So the two programs are absolutely the same now with the only exception that uh, e to the minus i 2 pi over n is replaced by e to the i 2 pi over n. The rest remains absolutely identical, which is really convenient, right? There is single algorithm going both ways. So back to fast multiplication of polynomials. We just showed how to compute DFT of a sequence in time n log n. We do the same for the other sequence. We multiply them point by point, right? And then we apply inverse Fourier transform to retrieve back the coefficients from the values. So on the first layer, we use twice n log n algorithm, then a linear time algorithm, and then once another n log n algorithm. Actually, it's of course two n log two n algorithm, but this is the same asymptotically as just O of n log n. Uh, and notice because of course linear function grows much small, slower than n log n, some total runs in time 
uh, n log n. Okay, so now we want to interpret the DFT. Now what I'm going to show you is really useful if you ever decide to study uh, multimedia, for example, JPEG or MP3, anything that involves digital signal processing. For some reason that is absolutely incomprehensible to me, most of the textbook on digital signal processing bombard you with formulas only without giving you an intuitive explanation of what is going on. And it's remarkable how much of digital signal processing uh, can be done in a purely geometric way that you can never forget just simply because everything has a geometric meaning. By the way, next Tuesday we will have guys from Dolby to show you how this uh, uh, how this is used in practice to do cool sound processing things. And they will uh, offer also internships with uh, uh, Dolby so you can get a taste of uh, how Dolby develops uh, their uh, uh, algorithms. Now they are into uh, moving uh, pictures, right? So. Uh, there is lots of uh, very interesting development going on. And they take my recommendations with the marks from this class when they decide who are the lucky guys to get uh, this opportunity for internship. So I'm going to show you purely geometrically what discrete Fourier transform is in a way that will automatically explain why it is so important and why it is used, for example, in sound processing. Okay, remember the scalar product, also called dot product, of two vectors with real coefficients. How do we compute scalar product? It's simply sum of the products of the corresponding coordinates. However, if the numbers are complex, if you live in a complex vector space, then the scalar products is defined as sum of the product of the first, of the coefficient of the first vector with the complex conjugate of the uh, corresponding coefficient of the second vector, right? So, um, besides scalar product, and we will see in a moment how to interpret it, we also have important notion of a norm of a vector, which is defined simply as the square root of the product of the vector, scalar product of the vector by itself. So what is this? This is the square root of this product, xi times xi conjugate. But the product of a complex number with its conjugate is precisely its, no, its length, right? Its absolute value, which is uh, the, the length of the vector from origin to that number, right? And for that reason, now you see why for the complex case, we have to conjugate to make sure that this is a positive number and the square root is taken with its positive value. So now this, uh, uh, so what is the norm? Norm is just a generalization of uh, the notion of the length of a vector. And you will see just what I told you that the power of mathematics is uh, in allowing you to do things that you don't understand. If, we will, if you take the advanced algorithm, you will see that this definition of complex, of uh, scalar product carries on to uh, functions, to signals such as sound. So it makes perfect sense to talk about the scalar product between two uh, sequences of samples of a sound or 
continuous time uh, waveform of the sound. What does it mean, norm of uh, sound? Well, no one has a clue. It's simply a mathematical construct that we understand perfectly well what norm is in, say, um, C cube or R cube, right? Simply the length of the vector, but the, the same calculus can be generalized to more complex objects. Okay, so now, um, note that the complex conjugate of omega n to the k, as we saw, is precisely omega n to the minus k. Because to do complex conjugation, you have to turn this plus into minus, but sine is an odd function, so you can put it inside, and you can put also minus inside the cosine, because cosine is even, so you get precisely this. Okay, so what we saw, you remember the row of our matrix multiplied by a column. Well, this says just one thing, that uh, this vector is orthogonal to any other vector for different k, say m, right? Because here we are doing complex conjugation, right? So essentially what we have that any two rows of our matrix, their scalar product is zero. And we call, when the scalar product is zero, we call these two vectors orthogonal. And on the other hand, the norm of this vector, when k is equal to m, right, when we are multiplying the vector by itself, will be n. So essentially this means that these two vectors are mutually orthogonal if k is not equal to m um, and uh, if k is equal to m, then we are simply computing the norm of that vector and uh, uh, taking square root, uh, right? We saw that this product is n, so the norm is actually square root n. So, we like, as you will see in a moment, it's very convenient that coordinate vectors be unit vectors, right? In three dimensions, in R3, you have zero, uh, you have one, one, one as the unit vectors, right, on the three axes. So we would like to make this vector also unit, so we simply have to divide it by its norm, which is square root n. So now we have that the norm of all these vectors for any k is one, and when k is not equal to m, uh, they are, the product is zero, which means that they are mutually orthogonal, namely these vectors form an orthonormal basis for the vector space of all complex valued sequences of length n, right? So let's now look what our discrete Fourier transform is from this slide. Well, we form this polynomial. Notice we put a star because the original polynomial P A of X is divided by one over N. Uh, and then we compute the DFT of this sec sequence. What do we have? To compute the DFT, we have to compute all the values for omega N to the minus K. Now we are using minus uh, negative exponents going forward, right? If you replace this, this is what you get, right? These are the powers uh, of the variable, right? Um, now you can take this square root n inside, but what are these vectors, with these uh, uh, numbers? Well, they are just coordinates of this vector. So, the discrete Fourier transform, geometrically, is nothing but the orthogonal projection of your sequence A onto the unit vector 
ek. Yeah? So it's just this length, uh, a sequence of these lengths, right? So, um, so going forward, you simply find the scalar product of your original sequence and the coordinate vectors. So remember, like in three-dimensional space, right? <clears throat> you take any vector, you can represent it as sum of the three components. You project it on the first axis, you project it to the second axis, and you project it to the third axis, and some total of these projections times the unit vectors gives you back the original vector. So you see, the discrete Fourier transform has purely geometric interpretation. It's a representation, it's, a, it's the coordinates of your vector in this basis, in this orthonormal basis. Right? So now, just as I mentioned, any vector, if you have uh, n many orthonormal vectors, then any vector, right, can be seen as a linear combination of the projections of uh, your vector to each of the axes times each projection multiplies the corresponding unit vector. So you project A to A0 and multiply this, uh, because this is just a length, right? This is just a, a number. You multiply this number with the unit vector. You project to the second coordinate vector, and multiply with that uh, coordinate vector, and so forth. So that's the discrete Fourier transform is nothing but this picture where these vectors are not the usual vectors 1, 0, 0, 0, and 0, 0, 1, but they are vectors whose coordinates are the power of the roots of unity. Right? So, um, if you look so uh, after you this look, get this representation, look now at the kth coordinate of A. This will be AK here. Here, this scalar product, we know that these are just the values of our polynomial. And uh, the kth coordinate of i -th vector is simply omega n to the power i to the power k, right? So what do we have? Uh, we can now take this square root n outside and we get that this is simply um, the value of the polynomial whose coefficients are the values of the initial polynomial, right? At the roots of unity. Uh, but this is precisely what your inverse Fourier transform does, right? So AK is obtained by evaluating the polynomial whose values, whose coefficients are the values of the uh, polynomial that corresponds to the initial uh, sequence at the, uh, uh, at the roots of unity of order n. So, but this is precisely what, what the inverse Fourier transform does. So just to kind of you see, you can have, a, we consider two bases of C to the N, of vector space of a, a complex N tuples. One is your usual basis, right? Um, and the other basis consists of these powers of the roots of unity. Now one might wonder why would one bother at all to use such a complicated basis if we have a much simpler one? But the reason is uh, uh, quite deep and you will see it in a moment. Uh, right? So your vector A, which is in the basis B, 
right? It's just a linear combination of coordinates times the, these unit vectors. But also this vector can be represented as a sequence, uh, can be represented in this uh, complicated uh, basis, let's call it F for Fourier, right? And we saw that the coefficients in this basis are the values of your polynomial, right? With the initial uh, sequence, right? So DFT is nothing but operation of change of base. If you consider A0 up to AN to be a vector with the U in the usual basis 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, and so forth. The discrete Fourier transform simply represents the very same vector in a different orthonormal basis that is built from the powers of the roots of unity. And there is a very deep reason why this basis is so fundamentally important because this basis has a simple intuitive explanation. Let's look at that. Um, so this is representation of each coordinate in terms of the values uh, of your polynomial and uh, assume now that the original sequence, uh, AK, is a sequence of samples of a sound. Okay, so AK is the sequence. So if you take, you know, like on your compact disc player, it stores the sampled values of the air pressure, essentially, right? The voltage that corresponds to the air pressure. And this is your sequence A0 up to AK, yeah? right? Now, if you represent this sequence in this strange basis, this is what you accomplish. Note that these guys here are all samples of the function e to the i 2 pi m over n times t, right? Uh, at an instant uh, k. Yes? Sorry? Uh, yes, so we will see exactly t will be, okay, so you see, um, consider this root of unity, e to the i 2 pi m times k divided by n. So this would be omega m taken to the power k. But k can be instant, an instant of a continuous variable if I replace this k. So instead of looking at discrete instance in time, I now use a continuous variable. So what do I get? I get that these guys are nothing but the samples at integers of these complex exponentials. But what are these complex exponentials? They are simply sinus sinusoids, but complex sinusoids. The real part is cosine, imaginary part is sine, but they are pure harmonic oscillations. So essentially, this means that uh, when I represent, when I find the discrete Fourier transform, I simply uh, represent um, the, uh, my sequence of samples of the sound as a linear combination of samples of these sinusoids. And as M grows, the frequency of the sinusoids increases. Okay? So the absolute value of the Fourier coefficient, right, corresponds precisely to the amplitude of the corresponding complex exponential or uh, this 
pure harmonic oscillation, right? And we call this the spectral analysis. So you see, rather than representing vectors like this, we essentially represent the vector as samples of sine waves of increasing frequencies, right? So if you take, if you press a key on a piano and you record the sound by sampling sufficiently fast, the Dolby engineers will explain to you how fast, if you sample this sound fast enough and then you compute the discrete Fourier transform, the discrete Fourier transform will be everywhere but the absolute value will be everywhere, almost zero, and then a spike at the frequency of the tone that you played. So you see, that's the reason why we represent, uh, uh, why we use this strange basis. Because this basis uh, is simply the sequence of, as uh, when you go through K, with, uh, through time, is a simple, si simply a sequence of samples uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, si sinusoids. So if I represent my signal as a sample, as a linear combination of sinusoids, I essentially tell what frequencies are present there. And that's of Crucial importance, for example, assume that you, that you take uh, a temperature uh, every minute uh, over a whole year at uh, somewhere outside. And then this very, very long sample, and this is why FFT runs in times n log n, because you can have a billion of uh, samples, right? If you take FFT, how many peaks will your FFT dis, uh, display? How many distinct frequencies are present? What is the fastest spinning frequency? What's the periodicity, the shortest periodicity of the temperature out there? Almost periodicity. Day, right? Because during daytime, uh, the, the temperature rises during the night, it goes down, so you will have one peak at the frequency that corresponds to day, one day. What will be the next peak? Seasons, right? You will have four large uh, peaks that, uh, or uh, troughs, right? Four, four peaks that correspond to the seasons. How do they search for extra um, uh, exoplanets? How do we find planets that orbit uh, uh, distant stars? Yes? Well, one way is to look for the dimming of light as a planet moves across the star. Very good. So first way is looking at dimming of light. Now notice how daunting that problem is, because we are observing that star from the Earth with atmosphere present, and there is a dinky little speck that is this planet that goes across the sun and it dims tiny, tiny little bit the intensity of the light as it crosses the surface of the star, but this is nothing compared to the disturbance from atmospheric. But if your record is extremely long, all the disturbances in atmosphere will produce a little contributions across all possible frequencies. But there will be one only perfectly regular cycling, and that's this dimming. So even though the signal-to-noise ratio is ridiculously bad, you can still detect it 
if you take sufficiently many samples, right, because the noise will distribute across all these complex exponentials, right, at uh, equal, approximately equally, and only this tiny peak will, uh, will, uh, will, be, will become noticeable. So fast Fourier transform is used even to search for um, extra exoplanets, what they call. Or if you want to predict the next big crash of the stock market, right, that is coming, um, and that will screw us up all, uh, what will happen if people try to look at the periodicities uh, because apparently, right, these kind of catastrophes tend to be periodic and looking at the spectrum of the stock market prices, they try to guess when the big uh, disaster will happen. How about uh, solar spots? What's the period of solar spots? Exactly, 11 years, I, if I remember correctly. Idea is the same, you count the number of spots, and this is your sampled value of the signal. You take the discrete Fourier transform, and you look where the peaks are. And I think the biggest one is uh, uh, every 11 years. So this is the value of fast Fourier transform. It can tell you in a complex sound what Tones are present. It can look for exoplanets. It can help you predict cyclic things. It can find cyclic things in immense amount of noise. So there is nothing, it, when you use MP3, your vo the music is compressed using uh, FFT, as you will hear from Dolby. Uh, when you use JPEG, it's again FFT. What is the idea of JPEG? It's very simple. You see, if you consider an, an image, you can kind of decompose it to a cyclic changes between bright and dark spots. If the picture is not completely white noise, completely random stuff, there will be only a few dominant cyclic components and JPEG simply picks them up and codes them and ignores the rest, roughly speaking, right? So FFT is also used when you want to compress uh, images. So please, uh, it's hard to overestimate the importance of FFT. Please read the slides. Uh, very carefully, there is also an example of computation of FFT by hand because that's the most useful algorithm you will see in your life, right? So please read this and lo and behold, next Tuesday, uh, you are coming for a, uh, bring your buddies uh, that are interested in applying for Dolby scholarship or just want to see cool technology in action. Okay, see you tomorrow.